uh, you started, um, uh, I like to say, out of the garage at Cairo University, all the way to uh, a great exit to Intend in March 2011. Um, can you share maybe the whole journey of entrepreneurship from start to exit? And uh, because from, from our perspective today in this part of the world, because we haven't seen many exits, it looks easy. But I'm sure you've gone through some, uh, some tough times. Yeah, <laughs> I can't, uh, <laughs> that would take hours. <laughs> uh, is this working, by the way? Everybody can hear me? Okay, it's difficult to <laughs> look at everybody here. But um, honestly, entrepreneurship, the name of the game, is uh, a rough and tough journey. Uh, I don't know of any entrepreneurs who had it easy. Um, so basically, uh, the, the problems I faced are not much different fundamentally from what every entrepreneur has faced. I've seen problems between the shareholders. I've seen you know, problems uh, of organizational nature, uh, attracting talent, etc. I've seen problems of raising fund. Um, I've seen problems, the main problem was because we were in, in, in a high uh, tech business of um, people not accepting high tech to come out of this region. Basically, I would fly to the Bay Area and say, oh, we have this great idea and this great product, etc." So where are you from? Egypt. Oh, Egypt. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, call us in a year. So I used to get all of these, you know, why Egypt? And why don't you take your company and come here and, and you'll be much better off? All of these things. And uh, throughout the journey, uh, that's what an entrepreneur does best, I would say, is just cruise along, um, not hit against, you know, um, um, preset, uh, difficult problems, but really uh, navigate through all the problems, finding simple solutions uh, until you reach somewhere. Um, but you pointed out the exit, and I think that's what we really uh, probably don't understand that well yet in this region. The big two exits are Maktouba, I think we will have a, a discussion about it, and SISD Soft, uh, which were sold to multinationals, etc., and, and made a big news. Um, and the question is, is that something, an exception, or can we turn it into... Before we get to the, to the exit, let's go into the heart of your story first and tell us how everything started, how, um, the, you know, the importance of bootstrapping at the beginning, the, uh, the team, how many founders did you have, and so how did it all start? It actually started uh, by solving a problem. The problem was, I was with a U.S. company, uh, another startup that went into the Wi-Fi space. Wi-Fi was hot in the late 90s, early 2000s. There were about 100 startups in the world uh, developing Wi-Fi, and this was one of them. They raised something like six, seven million dollars. We started uh, developing Wi-Fi. At that time, uh, there were no talent available in the U.S., so they asked me to assemble a team in, in Egypt because I'm an Egyptian. I said, we have talent. So I put together like 35 engineers, and they started developing the Wi-Fi solution, the, the software, the protocol stack, etc. cetera. Uh, but then came, everything happened. The, the bubble bust, 9-11, the economy was terrible, and all of a sudden, those 100 companies shrunk down to five. And the rest, the 95 companies which were doing startups in Wi-Fi, all went bust. And I got the call from the founder. I said, well, it looks like we have only one month to go. We don't have more money. We cannot raise money, etc." I said, OK, that's it. So the next day, literally the next day, I left this company. I started SysDsoft. Why? Because I knew I have 35 very well-trained, talented engineers who understand wireless technology. I had learned through the lesson of the Wi-Fi not to go into a very crowded space, understand what you do. So there was a learning curve that I used at the pedestal to start the whole idea. The engineers were there already. And then came the question of, yeah, bootstrapping. How do you start? 35 engineers, that's a monthly cost. You still don't have customers, etc. So bootstrapping, in my mind, was twofold. One is lower your cost as much as you can which is a very important lesson for any startup. Don't go crazy, even if you have money. You have to lower your cost as much as you can. 
and on the other hand, generate any quick win that can bring money into the company so you can start growing it. Again, literally two weeks later, I had the first contract with a German company. Uh, I said, what do you want? We, we have talent, we can do this. I, I didn't have a big plan for SysDisop, by the way. I just had talent. So I was selling that talent to start with. I said, let me sell that talent in a good way to do good things. And that company was in need for developers. And I said, um, we'll do it for you. I said, uh, Egypt, I said, the first three months, we'll not charge you any money. And if you like what you get, start paying us. Oh, this is great. So they couldn't say no. So that was on the customer side. On the cost side, I went to Cairo University where I graduated from my undergrad. And I said, you have all of this empty space, particularly in the evenings. Nobody's, I mean, most of the universities in Egypt, you know, they are full of people during the day. Hundreds of thousands, literally Cairo University has 250,000 students. You know, you go there at 5 p.m. until 8 a.m. next morning, zero. From 250,000 down to zero, empty space. I say, let me use that space. You don't need to do much, I'll use that space. You have computers that you turn off. Nobody in the world turns off computers at night. You're the only institution that turns off computers. Keep them up, it doesn't cost you much. I mean, some electricity, I'll pay for electricity, you know? So anyway, it cost me practically zero to set this up in a very nice space. I had a lot of um, graduate students work for me, so at the same time, it's very convenient for them. Go and take their classes, come back, work, go to the classes. I had four professors who were sort of my consultants, so they were also very conveniently located inside the university, etc. So I, I gained convenience, I gained low cost, and I managed to bootstrap, and I had the first contract. All of that in the first two weeks. So I think that's, that's what an entrepreneur is about. It's not about just the idea and the technology. It's about setting up the whole company and the processes and things in a very smart, lean way. I'm not an Intel or an IBM to do you know, full-fledged organizational <laughs> things. When I started, I was the IT guy of the company. I was the accountant of the company. I was the business development of the company. So I, that lowered my cost and gave me control on doing things. So be smart, innovative, uh, in the way you set up your business. At what point in time did your first investor, and I think it was Nadeem Sawiris, uh, come into uh, SysDisop? He came about uh, three and a half years later. So we bootstrapped for three and a half years without any money, which is a good lesson for a lot of startups today who even before starting, oh, we need some money. Well, what if there is no money? Would you abandon your idea? Would you not do it, you know? So we stayed for three and a half years, and we could have continued, by the way. We, had pro we were profitable on the first year already, and we could have made good profit and continued. The problem that I was facing at that time was scaling. The model I started with was sort of what I learned in India. You have talent, you sell that talent, you have a good margin. We had almost 100% margin on top of what the cost was. Because in Egyptian labor, technical labor was very inexpensive. But the problem was scaling. In India, I went to Wipro, which was one of my customers, by the way. They have 1,000 guys every morning go for interviews. The pipeline continues. At the end of the day, they hire about 100, 150. Every day, every day, 1,000 people come in, 150 get hired. There's no other country that can do that in the world. You know, I, I could barely hire 20, 30 a year very talented people. Uh, granted, that those were very selected, but the scaling would not work for me. The other problem I faced in 2007 time frame, it was precursor to me. It was an eye-opener that the crisis is going to come soon, actually. I was telling people the crisis is coming soon, a year ahead of the crisis, the financial crisis because I could see a slowdown of my customers. They were not asking, some of the contracts were stopping, and the problem is when you have 30 people in a contract, and then the contract terminates, what do you do with 30 people? So all of that forced me to start thinking a little bit, again, innovatively, to say, okay, I have the, the, the standard model, which is I'm offering services to design wireless technology to others, but when my people are free and I don't have contracts for them, 
I want to build something that I own. This way I have a balance of income and I have a future because what I build, I can sell to many. What I do as a service, I sell to one. So that's when I asked Nagib to come in. I said, I need to invest now a year worth of uh, manpower to build a new product. And at that time, WiMAX was the hottest thing in the market. And we, as a wireless company, started doing WiMAX technology. Um, and we invested in that and started licensing, etc. Uh, so that's when we got that investment. So was it just money, or was it also beyond money, the, the investment, like uh, Nagib said it is good? Well, actually, Nagib was an amazing investor because he gave me the money and forgot it. <laughs> so that's the. <laughs> that's the luxury you cannot really. I mean, I can only thank him for that because he never interfered with the company. He never asked me to do anything, and it was great. Got you. And to go to partnerships, you mentioned the difficulties in uh, you know, shareholders and that you learned a lot from that. What would you do differently in terms of? Uh, Partnerships and shareholders at the beginning, founders. Um, what, what is the lesson learned from the difficulties you, you have faced? I think the fundamental thing that I would do differently or advise people always to do now is, is really to, um, to write down what they agree upon and their differences quite early on. <laughs> who, will, who will do what? Exactly. Who's doing what? Who's in charge of what? I had three partners. And we were all aligned, yeah, let's do it, you know, and so on. But once we started, some worked more, some worked less, some had their hearts in it, some had two other jobs. Uh, we, we were different, you know? We, and we never thought about it uh, to write down or at least discuss openly the roles and responsibilities of the partners and their rights and their vesting and all of that. Initially, you tend to uh, avoid particularly culturally in our region. We, we avoid, we're friends, and let's do it together, of course. But fact is, once either you are in deep problems or once you see success, those two moments trigger problems. Any of these two trigger problems between part. Seeing success or seeing a big failure triggers the partners to start revisiting what they are doing. And that's when the problem starts. So the best thing is ahead of this big success or ahead of the big failure, write down who is in charge of what, what if scenarios, what if one of the partners just decides not to work in the company or decides to put more, etc. Okay, well, uh, we just have five minutes and I want to talk obviously about the exit. March 2011 was your exit to Intel. The timing is amazing. Why would someone, right after the Mubarak fall, fall down, would want to invest in Egypt. Well, how, how did you do it? Well, I think it's, it's something important for people to understand how to get to an exit at all, because that's the, the answer to your question. Uh, when you exit, particularly to a multinational, there has to be a genuine interest in what you're doing. I mean, it's not Egypt. They didn't come because it's Egypt. I could have been anywhere in the world. In this particular case, they came for a technology and a solution that I had that they didn't have and that they needed. They could have developed it, but it would have taken them a year or a, a year and a half. It would have taken them five to ten million dollars. And there would have been a risk because it wasn't developed yet there. Here is somebody who has that technology that can give it to them the next morning. We were ranked number one in the world in, in that technology that we had. So we were the fastest, the most efficient, etc., compared to our competitors. And Intel was behind. So they needed the product. And the negotiations actually started before the Arab Spring, before the revolutions. It started in 2010. And I had three other buyers. All four of them are among the top 10 in the world in uh, chipset production. So I was in a luxury position that four top guys were competing. I selected Intel, and I wrote exclusivity with them, but it could have been somebody else. So the fact that we closed in March uh, is irrelevant. The fact that there was a revolution in Egypt was irrelevant. Um, they just wanted the product. And that's, that's uh, in many cases, uh, an important factor. There are other factors, of course. They could come if I had a local or regional market 
and I'm conquering it. That's another way to start an exit, but I didn't have that. I was a global product. I just had a good product, and that's why they came to me. Uh, definitely not uh, in politics. <laughs> I'm too honest, too honest to be a politician. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I work and advise the government and everybody when it comes to entrepreneurship. I mean, entrepreneurship can also be uh, enabled through lots of uh, regulatory and legislative actions. For instance, in Egypt, it's very difficult to announce bankruptcy. And we know 70, 80% of the startups go bankrupt. So if that is something that scares you from the beginning, you would not even do it. And we advise the government how to do that, share options. We don't have share options uh, allowed in our system. So a lot of things I get into are not because of political, but more of helping entrepreneurship through the political system. Somebody there. Uh, thank you for this interview. Sam uh, Lobby uh, At what point in time uh, did you uh, think of developing the technology that actually attracted uh, Intel? Was it, you mentioned that you did not have a, a roadmap or a plan in the beginning. So at, one, at what point did you find this technology and decide you wanted to do this? I was continuously looking for a technology in our core companies, which was wireless. We were in wireless, okay? So WiMAX was the hottest thing. Unfortunately, WiMAX died too fast. It didn't make it big as promised. Uh, and before we saw that happening, we, I, I used to have weekly meetings with our technical guys and say, look at all other alternatives in wireless space. And they came up with, you know, sensors and, uh, and but we selected based on not just how sexy the technology is, but also where we are with respect to the development cycle. So we picked up LTE, which is the fourth generation for mobile, in uh, early 2008, knowing that it will be implemented in the markets in 2010, 2011 timeframe, the first implementation ever. So we knew we had two years timeframe to be there. And that's the best timing. If you are too early, it doesn't help you. And if you come late, if we were late by six months, we would not have made it. Our competitors would have beaten us. So it, timing, it's a very good question. Timing is so crucial, particularly in technology, because it's evolving so fast. And the development cycle of any technological product today used to be 10, 15 years in the 80s, is down to three years now. From the inception of the idea to being in the market, it's three years. Hardware, software, uh, integration, everything. So timing, timing, timing. Shelly Porges, United States, former head of the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the U.S. State Department and serial entrepreneur and investor. So during our private conversation earlier, you told me that now as you're looking forward to your investments, um, you're actually looking at the array of opportunities outside of technology. Could you comment on that? Right. Maybe I didn't answer or elaborate on the first aspect, which is after exiting I, I used one-third of the exit money to establish an angel fund to help startups and, and invest in them. And it's actually the only fund I know of that's not for profit. So it's done as a give back. And um, when I started, I was tending to invest more in technology companies. And we had you know, a hype in 2011 after the revolution. Uh, I could name almost a 1,000 companies that came up you know, with the spirit that we had, the, the euphoria of, of bringing Mubarak down, etc. Um, and they were mostly two, three guys writing an app on a mobile and uh, trying to build a company. 
And uh, as innocent as I was as an investor, I was excited by a lot of that. And over the time, everybody is starting to learn uh, the lessons. And the lesson I learned is technology is, is a low barrier to entry, but it's a blue ocean. And particularly apps and mobile and all of that, and, and capitalizing on mobile advertisement. And everybody's promising almost the same story. And it, uh, nobody's making money from mobile advertisement except those three companies that we all know of. So uh, it's, it's very tough. And to me, because part of it was giving back, it wasn't that rewarding to the, to the local ecosystem in Egypt. And I look at Egypt and I say, there are zillions of problems. Guys, be innovative, be entrepreneurial, go and solve the garbage problem. Go and solve the healthcare problem. Go and solve the education problem. And by doing so, you're an entrepreneur, you're doing something good for the country, and you'll make tons of money because nobody is competing with you, as opposed to mobile apps. So over time, I started investing more and more into companies that have really applied solutions, innovative, yet simple, for existing chronic problems in Egypt. As a social entrepreneur. I'm not a social, I, I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I want them to make money, I want them to grow, create opportunities to others. If every one of them does the same that I did, eventually there will be 20, 30 investors in Egypt helping and the ecosystem would grow very fast. That's what I'm looking for. Every penny has to be reinvested. I will never draw dividends from it. Interesting, great. Thank you. Thank you for the interview. Uh, Patrick Ball uh, with the USA Georgia Competitive Program here in the Business Park. Um, you mentioned your current role advising the government on entrepreneurship. What are some key uh, aspects that the public sector can play uh, in enabling entrepreneurship in the region? I think that there is a lot to be done. If from the minute of uh, how easy it is to establish your company. You know, it's still not very easy, in, at least in Egypt. It takes paperwork and so on. I would like them to make it on the net. You know, why do you care about where he lives and what kind of uh, electricity bill he has paid and give me a copy of your mother's uh, birth certificate to establish a company, you know? Uh, uh, you're really forcing them to go to the gray economy. And we have a huge gray economy in Egypt because of that. Make it easy, you know, you just want people to start and create jobs and so on. So that's the first step. Make it easy for them to, to, to raise money by giving what the central bank in Lebanon did, for instance, some guarantees on, on, on the investment and so on. Uh, make it easy for them to announce that they are, have gone bankrupt and they cannot continue. Uh, make it easy for them to form mergers and partnerships and so on. None of that is practically there. There are ways of doing it, but they are all cumbersome, very complex, and we need to uh, make them much easier. That's, that's the message I send. And give them hope. I, I mean, if, if all the contracts and everything is big and only for big institutions, you, you look, we have a huge project now called the Suez Canal project. And you look at what's in it, it's, it's all for the huge companies. Why not embed in a project like that micro projects that entrepreneurs can participate in? This way you get more uh, people in, uh, engaged, you get innovative ideas. The big companies have very limited innovation. You know, I worked for IBM, I worked for Intel, I'm in big technology companies of the world, and I tell you, they are not entrepreneurial anymore. Uh, you have to be small and agile and, uh, you know, so that's what our governments in this region need to think about and not be afraid of those young guys and give them the power. What's next for me? Uh, I was ready for retirement, actually. <laughs> but I always uh, feel bad about retiring while I can still give back to some of the young people. I work for the young. I say that all the time. I work for them. So, Any time, any time. I give all the time to the young people, not just in Egypt. I work with some young people in Lebanon, in Dubai, and all over the place. So uh, uh, that's what keeps me uh, alive, and uh, I, I would like to continue that. Okay, well, thank you so much, Khalid. Thank Very you. Inspiring.